So here in this video, we're going to talk about the upcoming correction in our markets, what kind of effect that can have on Tesla stock. And oh wait, if you're confused by the last video that came out there, I said Tesla stock is going to double by October to mark my words. Well, I still think that's going to happen. I, I, I don't think that changed and my mental state of evaluating this market did not change from four hours ago when that other video came out at 4 p.m. But there is a correction coming and I want to share with you guys my perspective on this. But first, holy moly, when I seen this clip on CNBC last night, I said, holy shit, I can't believe he said this on live TV, literally calling AI a bubble. But at the same time, believes this bubble has a lot further to inflate and the S&P 500 hitting 7,000 by next year. Pretty incredible interview. Take a listen to it. Full call, S&P 500 at 7,000 by next year. I want to ask you, what's the catalyst? Is it almost entirely AI enthusiasm or are there other factors like Fed rate cuts, nearshoring, et cetera? Well, there's a bit of Fed rate cuts in there. That will help. Uh, we think there's probably room for two cuts this year uh, with more to come next year. Our forecasts are a bit below uh, what the market's pricing in terms of the future path of interest rates. So that helps. That certainly helps the equity market story. Uh, and there's some earnings growth as well. We, we've argued for a while that we think the US is on a, on a path to a soft landing. Uh, that helps corporate America. So there's some earnings growth. But it's, as you suggest, principally uh, about this inflation of a bubble uh, around AI. And I think it is a bubble. Uh, we've done a lot of work looking at the economic and the market consequences of, of groundbreaking technologies such as AI. Uh, and one of the lessons from history is that it takes a long time for these technologies to, to generate productivity gains. Uh, we think in the case of AI, they'll come, but they'll come towards the end of this decade. Uh, but markets tend to try and capture those perceived future benefits ahead of them actually crystallizing right, in the real economy. Let me go back to Pension one thing you said. I want to go back to what you said. So you, you said you think it's a bubble, but clearly you don't think this bubble is anywhere near popping because you think we're going to hit 7,000 next year. Exactly. That's exactly it. So if, okay. it, if we're right and it's a bubble, uh, then it has further to inflate. Now, there's different ways you can measure this and no two bubbles are the same, clearly. Uh, but the tech, uh, the dot com bubble at the turn of the the the, the 2000s, um, perhaps is a, is instructive in this regard. And if you look at things like forward twelve months earnings um, mm -hmm. uh, P ratios, that suggests that this bubble's no way near yet at peak valuations. Okay. So no, you're hitting on Not something over forward, and over again. Earnings. You, you keep mentioning you keep mentioning earnings. Okay, so I, I do want to talk to you about earnings. Uh, Strategists out with a note. Um, you know, talking about sales for techs, expecting to have the strongest growth rate at nine and a half percent outperforming the S&P's overall growth rate of 4%. They go on to say uh, they're warning that the biggest risk to earnings, uh, first we're talking about sales, now we're talking about earnings, is a shift from AI euphoria to AI disappointment. I'm just looking at the earnings estimates. Uh, Q2, 11% earning estimate. And then for Q4 and Q1 of next year, 15% earnings estimates. Each one of these inflection points of earnings, how important are they on, in your mind to get to this path of 7,000? If we see a stumble in any one of these earnings periods, does that break down your case or can it still power past that no i think if, if we get a stumble in the in the earnings picture then i think it does break down the case but so far we've not really had that right you know if you look at um if you look at the the the, the the path of earnings, they've continued to grind higher and continue to, to blow past expectations in, in, in most cases. So um, now the point is that that you still get devaluations that look very frothy despite those, the, 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 that solid earnings growth. So I think we continue to get solid earnings growth. It's just that investor enthusiasm um, uh, it perhaps outpaces that, that, that earnings growth. Okay. Also, why 7,000? I mean, what's about that number? That kind of implies a 25% increase from where we stand right now. Again, hitting our 37 record high. Um, what's about, what is about 7,000 in your mind that's the number? Like, why isn't it 8,000? Why isn't it 6,500? Exactly. That's, that's a good question. Um, the, 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 the simple answer to that is that if you look at the typical, the, the level that valuations tend to get to uh, in bubble territory, in bubble conditions around new technologies, uh, that gives you a, that gives you an anchor for your forecast. Um, so we can look at the valuations uh, that, that we've seen in the past, and we can try and project those forward. When you do so, you get to a kind of seven thousand number, maybe even a maybe even a touch higher. Uh, but if, but like I say, that it, it, this is a bubble. This is the, I think we should be in no two okay. to to. Uh, it, there should be no doubt about that. That last sentence, I think, was powerful. He said AI is a bubble. There should 
be no mistakes about that. That's something that I've talked about here on this channel a lot. I've gotten a lot of backlash on that. A I'm, I'm an uber bull on AI overall, but I think it's going to take a lot longer than the markets expect. I mean, let's be honest. We're expecting these great numbers from AI projects by hyperscalers and companies that are implementing AI this quarter earnings, next quarter earnings, and to really pick up in 2025. And you're just not going to see that. So there will be disappointment. The expectations are too high. And this individual thinks they're going to get a lot higher before that bubble does ultimately pop. That note from Strategis I also thought was pretty interesting. They say again, looking back at earnings during the tech bubble also shows a similar trend of earnings peaking before price. The biggest risk to earnings is a shift from AI euphoria to AI disappointment. Now, we've seen a lot of AI disappointment last quarter believe it or not, but the companies that mattered did okay, like NVIDIA. And I think NVIDIA will still do okay, but compared to last quarter, expectations are even higher now that AI will start to become more of a meaningful impact to companies' businesses via your hyperscalers. That's a Microsoft, that's a Google, that's an Amazon, that's you know your other big tech names, your other software stocks. And that's not going to materialize and we have to be realistic with ourselves. Now, what happened after last uh, quarter's earnings is you did get a pullback, right? You did get an S&P 500 that dropped from the highs to the lows of about 6% or so. And I think when you add to the factors that are contributing to our markets today, perhaps that pullback could be about double what you've seen then. I think we could look at a correction of 10 to 12%, which a 12% pullback from here would put you back on the S&P to about 487. And let's be honest, at this point, that would actually be healthy to see that, which perhaps maybe you just fall straight to your 200 day moving average. Maybe that's a better level to look at. That would be a drop of about 12.6% down to about $484.54 per share. And I mean, let's be honest, the warning signs of a correction are literally everywhere. As Bar Chart writes on X, only 46% of S&P 500 stocks are trading above their 100-day moving average, the lowest level since November, yet the S&P sits at all-time highs. Incredible. Back during November, the S&P was anywhere from about 410 to 420 on the SPY. You're at 554 today. That has been upside of about 37 and a half percent. And yet you have the lowest level of stocks trading above the 100 day moving average since then. That just shows how narrow this market truly is. And Zero Hedge post a similar chart and says, just when you think it can't get any wider, this is the NASDAQ's performance versus the NASDAQ advanced decline uh, decline line, and it, it is just getting worse and worse, now down to some of the lowest levels that you have seen in many years as the NASDAQ just continues higher. This typically leads to a very large correction. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if the advanced decline line actually starts to move higher as the NASDAQ itself falls, meaning you could actually get big tech that is leading this market fall and the rest of the markets actually start to improve and start to, you know, go higher. Either way, these two tend to, to, to line up historically and eventually they will again. And that either means a massive broadening out of our markets or a huge fall. And it's literal, literally only a matter of time before one of those things happens. Maybe we just stay at this weak place in the markets and the top 10 stocks or so continue to rally and maybe it ends with the bubble popping. 
it could take another year or two. Let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Fernando over on X says, bulls keep ignoring the triple divergence on the monthly chart. When this gives 300 points, a daily drop is coming. The fun starts next week. Until then, enjoy the last few days of this bull market coming to an end. 4,500 by the end of July for the S&P 500. Wouldn't that be something? That would be almost a 19% crash in the S&P 500 in like two weeks. Seems very unlikely, even to me, that thinks a correction is coming. That would be way out of my forecasted expectations. Holder on X, um, he says, if you want to know why the markets have risen so sharply last week, you can also find an explanation in this chart. U.S. net liquidity has risen significantly this week by $270 billion back to over $6 trillion, although the Fed's balance sheet has continued to shrink slightly. So more liquidity out there typically means higher prices for assets. Macro charts on X says volatility is dead. Now 45 days without a 1% decline. Related short volatility remains extremely crowded. If, if and when this streak ends, it could mark another key turning point. Because typically when you do see these periods of just, you know, straight up moves essentially, it does tend to end with a correction or a crash. You can also see from JC Parrots on X, he says, here is the small cap Russell 2000 hitting new 23-year lows versus the S&P 500 this week. Jason Gobert on X says, the NASDAQ composite keeps hitting new highs while a bunch of its stocks fall to new lows. It's nearly double the prior record. Nothing matters, though. Zero Hedge writes this on X. The MAG7 is up 48% year to date. SP 493 is up 7.5%. And the Russell just went red for the year again. Tom Lee shares this post from Michael A. Arit on X and says, That's the most scary chart I've seen in a while. Unfunded and pensioned entitlements in major European countries between 300 and 500 percent of GDP mixed with collapsing demographics is a recipe for debt disaster. Tom Lee says, Time for MMT. That stands for Modern Monetary Theory. Now, if you don't know what Modern Monetary Theory is, the long story short, version of this is if you're a country you can just spend as much as you want if you are the government but the google definition says modern monetary theory mmt is an economic theory that ex that examinates the role of government spending and taxation in an economy it suggests that government spending and taxation should be used to achieve full employment and price stability, and that government deficits are not necessarily bad for the economy. It says here, modern monetary theory, according to Investopedia, is a heterox, hetero, heterodox uh, macroeconomic um, suppos, supposition that asserts, asserts that monetarily... Sovereign countries such as the US, UK, Japan, and Canada, which spend tax and borrow in a fiat currency that they fully control, are not operationally constrained by revenues when it comes to the federal government. So basically, spend, spend, spend. Which, yes, that has negative implications for inflation, but really good for your asset prices. Now, if you guys want to know the real reason, I think at least at bare minimum, a correction is coming. In fact, I know a correction is coming. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a financial planner. I'm just giving you this information before Wall Street does, before you start to see some down days to get you ahead of what is coming next. It comes down to earnings and expectations. So if you take a look at the expected EPS growth rate for this quarter, Wall Street is expecting 9.6% for this quarter, 8.7% for Q3, and 17.7% for Q4, with an overall year-over-year -year earnings growth rate of 11.3% in 2024 and 14.4% in 2025. Now, you might say, those are fantastic numbers. That is awesome. And you would be correct. That is true. Those are big numbers. But they are completely unrealistic numbers, and we're not going to meet them. In fact, the bigger issue is perhaps the 14.4% EPS growth rates that are expected in 2025. And this is closer to about 15% after the rally that we have seen recently. That was last updated on June 21st. And the reason 2025 is, is so important in particular is because 
we are going to start to see expectations get lowered. As the economy gets worse, companies are going to lower expectations. You've seen this with Nike. Nike was down 20%. Well, because they said 2025 is not going to be as great of a year as they thought it was going to be. And Wall Street is starting to pay attention to 2025. So in theory, if our growth rates are good for 2024, it's going to be very hard to tack on another 14, 15% coming next year. And markets price in forward returns. And I think you're going to get a lot of what happened with Nike. You're going to beat on EPS. You're going to see companies doing okay on EPS because they're cutting costs. But their forward-looking guidance is not going to be nearly as good as Wall Street needs it to be. In fact, we started off this year with the expectation of like 6 to 7% EPS growth for this year and a roughly the same for 2025. Those estimates have doubled just from the start of the year until now. We haven't even gotten Q2 earnings yet, and you've seen expectations double for this year's EPS and next year's EPS. That's never setting you up well in the short term. That means you fully priced in a very optimistic scenario. And take a listen to what this guy says about earnings being priced for perfection. My next guest says this record-setting rally could be running out of runway. Joining me now is Kevin Simpson. He is the founder and CEO of Capital Wealth Planning. It's good to see you. Why are we running out of runway? Some say we've got a lot of room left to go here. I think over the longer term, intermediate term, absolutely, we, we've got longer, um, higher and better. But over the short term, I think volatility is going to play a bigger part. Obviously, with the election, there's going to be tremendous volatility, at least within the headlines. But just looking at how stocks are priced, Scott, since February, we've been very, very range bound. The Dow's up 5%, the equally weighted S&P's up 5%, maybe 4 or 5% in that range. Most of that return came in January and February. We know the AI story. I mean, there's nothing more to talk about the fact that they're pulling everything higher within the broader indices. But I just think that markets are priced to perfection right now for most of the market, for most stocks. And if we get a little volatility, if we get a little air pocket, I think it's a buying opportunity, not something you're trying to time or sell the news. But I just think with the market that hasn't given us a 5 or 10 percent pullback in seemingly so long that we may see some opportunities here in the shorter term. How could we be priced for perfection in so many stocks when so many stocks haven't performed nearly as well as the mega cap tech ones have? Yeah, you know, there's absolutely value in some of the names that we own because their earnings have gone higher and their stock prices haven't moved. They've been buying back shares, so their, their P.E. ratios have come down a little bit. I think I'm talking more just the broader index because you, you talked earlier about the market calls of 5,600, 5,800, 6,000 on the S&P. So much of that earnings is fueled by the big tech stocks. Here we are in July. We can start looking forward to 2025 earnings, but they need to be the the big boys here. They need to be the ones to carry that market. So for for the broad indices, I think they're uh, very close to perfection. Oh, I I got you. I got you. I mean, that's why, precisely why some always point to the outperformance at the index level versus the individual stock level when looking at year-to-date performance of the markets themselves. Now, let me ask you this, because I, I look at your holdings, okay? And you know, unlike many that we've been speaking to lately anyway, um, you hold a bunch of stocks in a wide swath of areas, right? You've got Caterpillar, Conoco, Walmart, Verizon, TJX, Procter, Honeywell, Home Depot. I've only named a smattering of the ones you have. My point is they're outside of mega cap tech, yet you suggest to our producers outside of AI, there's not much compelling or that we feel that we need to own or rush to own in, in any way. Man, if that doesn't say what the current market environment feels like, I don't know what does. Yeah, you know, it's been like that for two years. So maybe I've got um, PTSD with these value names. But if you look at this week, truth be told, we had a half day Wednesday, a lot of people playing hooky today. It was a huge day today for economic data. We'll get that digested by the markets, I think, on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. You look at the ISM manufacturing on Monday, not great. ISM service on Wednesday, like contracture, like very much in contraction territory. If you strip out the COVID years, it was like the worst print we've seen 
seen since 2009. So it shows the economic growth is slowing a little bit. And I think that's what the Fed expects. Today, the jobs number was really good from the perspective of what the Fed wants to see, 4.1% mm-hmm. unemployment. It, it, it's not horrible, but it's, it's looking at that dual mandate, jobs, inflation, and inflation is coming down, even though it's stalled for a while. So the good news is bad news um, mantra holds for now because it gives the Fed the ability to move forward the rate cuts. I think after today, December is like a sure thing. Uh, September still maybe 50-50. It's going to be data dependent. I don't mm-hmm. think they're going to rush into it. I listened to the great interview with the professor. I understand the theory that sooner the better so that you don't run the risk of uh, t- tripping over a recession before you start rate cuts. But I don't know that if a September rate cuts the first one or a December, it's going to make that much of a difference. I think the idea that you're going to see at least one rate cut this year is is constructive. The market is absolutely pricing in two, Scott. So that is why we are 100% about to see a correction at the bare minimum. Now, of course, I could be wrong. I make big statements all the time. Do not take it as financial advice. It's not financial advice. A correction should be welcomed. You should have a shopping list. You could be ready to buy these stocks when they do go through this correction. Now, who knows how big it's going to be? I believe it's probably going to be about 10 to 12%. Could it be 15%? Of course. Could it be 20%? Of course. I think 20%, you'd really have to see a big disappointment on earnings, um, especially around AI. But uh, I think a 10 to 12% correction could come even if earnings meet expectations, even if there's some good, some bad, just because expectations are so high and it's not really room for them to go any higher at this point. So, yes corrections coming but what does this mean for tesla now i think again there's two kind of corrections there is a rotational correction big tech comes down rest of the markets go up and i think that is kind of what we're set up for until you start to get recession fears when it looks like a recession's coming when the fed gives you that first cut could be september could be november could be december on average the s&p tends to fall about 23 percent when the fed gives you that first cut so from now until that first cut i think you're only set up for a correction a larger crash could come with a fed policy error because let's be honest i don't think the fed's gonna cut until they're forced to cut and they don't want to cut before the election and they probably should have already been cutting so they're gonna cut after the election and by then it's probably gonna be far too late already to uh you know essentially avoid um, some of this economic pain that I think we're likely to go through. But a simple correction from here of 10 to 15% is likely, in my personal opinion, just because of how elevated expectations are. Again, I still think Tesla stock will double by October. I can envision a scenario where we go through a correction, but Tesla stock could still rally the whole time. In fact, Tesla, a lot of the times, inverses the markets anyways, where you know you see a lot of people pile into Tesla, um, when there's a, a, a wave of good things happening for Tesla, even as the markets come down. So still think Tesla is going to double regardless by October, hit new all-time highs by the end of the year, if you want to be a little bit more conservative. Um, and this whole correction in the markets really doesn't change anything. I think it's really just a correction of big tech, some of your AI enthusiasm for especially a lot of your hyperscalers that are not going to have successful AI products for a long time. Even when you look at Tesla, Tesla has no AI hype embedded in it at all. And Tesla stock hasn't done much of anything because of it. Do you really need to correct Tesla with no AI hype? Whereas you have Google, Amazon, Apple, uh, Meta, all these other companies that have all this AI hype, but no AI products. I mean, come on, it's 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 as simple as that. Um, pretty easy to see this uh, correction coming. And I don't think it's going to have much of an effect on Tesla at all. So let me know what you think about this down below in the comment section. Hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel. Most importantly, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I will see you back here tomorrow.